welcome back. So this is my first post in a while. The last series I did was on how to flash the community firmware to the CR6. And now I've had my head down for a while, more than I'd like to admit, um, refactoring the touchscreen user interface uh, firmware. Um, Insanity Automation took this uh, quite a ways. Uh, and uh, let us know that the 82114 tool was going to be the DJS tool we'd need to use now to make um, to compile, let's say, the firmware in a format on DWIN set that runs on every version of DJS2, uh, which this does now. Um, so the version that's bundled, as you remember, uh, on the main board, a firmware package will only run on 3.5 correctly. Uh, you either get a blank screen or uh, touch buttons that don't work if you're trying to load it onto other versions of DJS2. Uh, this one does run on everything, although what I see in the early versions, I have a replacement screen with DJS 1.4 on it and the kerning that the DGIS tool uh, performs automatically to space characters in the fields does not function on 1.4. So you see, say, a large space between a period and a, and a and the first decimal place character. And in things like the ABL mesh, that just puts everything outside the boxes. It's, it's ugly and, and you wouldn't like it. So it will run on all DGIS uh, interfaces, at least when you touch the buttons, it does behave. Um, when it comes to the really old DGIS things, like the replacement screen 1.4, you'd want to upgrade that first. So I've included some upgrade files, uh, 3.5 in, in particular, and of course in the main board bundle zip file are a couple of extra files in addition to the DGIS OS. So I'll continue to look at that. I, I have a 1.4 screen now with this interface on it that I'm planning to update to 3.5 to see if that alone will solve the problem. And if not, I'll bundle the other two files in as well the way um, the main board firmware does. So for now, what I want to do is create a video, uh, probably a playlist because there's way too much detail to fit into one short video. The series that I'm still scheming out um, that would give you an overview of the interface. Just this is what it looks like. These are the buttons you're intended to push for that purpose. Here is a suggested workflow for which the design by Creality seemed to have been optimized. And what we did was start with that assuming familiarity with it by people migrating from the CR6, um, which isn't always the case if you're still unboxing the printer and busy flashing the community firmware before you even start. There's no familiarity factor. But for those of us who have seen other printers and so on, there tend to be logical groupings of function to minimize switching screens when performing certain workflows. And the buttons tend to fall into a kind of a logical grouping. There's one or two strays that'll move from place to place or be duplicated. But anyway, all of that to say the user experience is not documented anywhere. The intended user experience is not described anywhere that I can find. So I thought, okay, it's long overdue. Let's create a little video that says here is the user experience you are intended to have with a community firmware touchscreen design. I will use the refactored firmware as my model because A, I like to show it off. Uh, it needs a bit of exposure now because I'm the only one looking at it on my machine to date. Uh, I only posted it to my repository on GitHub last night and I posted a pointer to it on the Discord this morning under, uh, or last night rather, under LCD discussion. Um, it's very new. Um, I think it looks cool. You probably find the colors in this video are not quite true to the colors that you get on your printer. Um, I'm doing the best I can with the camera, but it is what it is. Color's a funny thing. Um, and it's the color that concerns me just a tad because when not everybody has the same taste and I've locked it into this color scheme now. There's no button to change it. But my goal was to make this fresh and a, an interesting looking to make it really high con, you know, highly usable for those of us with old eyes who need contrast to be able to read digits. Um, within the constraints of the DGIS technology and the DWIN technology, this is um, something I'm proud of. I'm hoping you will like it. And by making the colors distinctive, uh, different from the original bundled one, it'll be that little bit easier for those of us who are helping others to avoid the 20 question thing about which version are you using just by looking and we'll see which version of the interface you're working with. It may yet turn out that there's a bug hiding in there somewhere. I worked really hard uh, beating the bushes and flushing them all out. I was continually finding just another thing to tweak, another thing to tweak every time I thought I was ready to go. So I know I'm, I'm um, following a workflow that basically says, just do it, and if there's anything wrong, we'll find that and fix it. Um, 
I've churned this. There's a lot of iterations behind it. It should be solid. So now I'm going to take you through the interface and we'll see uh, if you make sense of the logic. If you have questions about it, don't hesitate. Put the questions down at the bottom. If this video serves your purposes and makes you happier, please subscribe and hit the like button. It helps keep the channel going. So right now, let's take you for a tour of the interface. Hang on there. I'm going to push a button and then I'm going to change camera and then we're going to get at it. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is show you this is the replacement screen I'm talking about. It's still running Teachers 2 version 1.4 right now. It'll give me a chance to show you what the kerning problem is that I'm talking about so you'll recognize it if you see it. And then I will perform that update I said I was going to do and we'll know in real time whether I need to update it with just 3.5 or 3.5 plus the extra files. This is what I've done. I put this into a uh, a standalone screen support produced by our uh, our fearless leader there at Sabaz. It's posted on uh, his uh, printables page, and yeah, I'll put a link to it. Uh, and what it allowed me to do, I modified his design a little bit to make this gashy, go ugly hole here. I've modified the fusion file, but I never bothered to reprint it. So I might put up a remix if uh, this looks popular. The idea is that I've got a a simple cover that I can put over that gashy hole and it looks a little bit strange but clean yeah and I can stand this on a table and, uh, and because that's TPU it doesn't slide around very much it's even got a, a prop at the back I can adjust with a little tension wheel here and then change the angle so I can stand this near my printer if only my table was big enough and I got this little adapter harness on here I did a cheat I used uh, one of the what should be a PCB mounted socket as an adapter, I plug those pins into the motherboard connector on the motherboard and I'm able to drive this display directly from the printer with the firmware on it and because of the angle it'll help me with the photography of what's going on. It's easier to get at than it is to try and look at the um, OEM screen mounted at that goofy angle and, and so on. So that's a videography thing. But um, here, when I, when I take the bottom off here I have full access to the flash without taking the back off the display. I can poke, uh, I think there's one in here, I can poke this SD card and take it in and put it, take it out and put it in uh, when I'm doing my flashing. So that's the behind the scenes, uh, what's been going on on the videography. Now let's get to the demonstration of the interface itself. Okay, so let's see how this looks when I power up my printer. The boot screen now has the identifier branded into the bitmap so that you will know exactly which version you're working with. Or every version of the refactored firmware has the correct version number burned into it and a readme file that tells you which version it describes to go with it in the release file. So you get a four button menu when you first boot up the machine. That assumes a certain workflow order that you're normally going to perform. Now, every time you turn on the machine you may have a different objective so you're not always going to follow all four, all four steps. But the four steps were laid out sort of in a progression from I've pulled it out of the box, I put the firmware on it, I'm now telling it my preferences for the configuration of my system, then I go into calibrate and I say okay let's get the bed leveling mesh established, let's set up the PID tuning parameters, let's define the e-steps for my printer and then I should be done here. Now in real life things change, you change filament, you need to come back here, you don't just do calibrate one time. So it's not in the setup menu, it's over here as a target of its own. Some days you're coming here specifically to spend time calibrating the printer. You're working mostly in there. When you're ready to do a print and you're satisfied the setup should be the same one you've already established and calibration is already established, you're coming in now to prepare. And prepare is things like let's load some filament so that when I push go the filament's already staged and ready to, to extrude. Let's uh, control the, the temperatures, let's set it to the default temperatures, say on nozzle and bed for PLA and walk away to give it a nice hot soak before I start my print, that sort of thing. And then you're ready to print, you come over and you say let's print and as long as there's a card in the socket you'll be seeing what's on the card, you'll be able to browse through those contents and pick the thing you want to print, push go and you're off. So that's the initial workflow philosophy of the user interface and that 
should help you guess where to look when you have a specific thing you want to do. There are a couple of functions that are in more than one place, partly because they are actually something you would do in separate workflows. In each case you might want to do a pit tuning for instance, so pit tuning is available on setup and on calibrate. I'm trying to help you avoid changing screens if you don't have to, anticipating what your workload uh, desires might be. Now there are other menus you haven't seen yet. And those menus are accessed when you come to print. So if I select any of these files and I say I'd like to print that please, it says Are you sure it was that one in case I missed when I pointed. I say yes. Standing up and trying to operate this thing with parallax and so on. So that's the uh, I am printing menu. When you're printing you're able to pause the print, stop the print, or go into a tune menu and access a whole lot of other settings. You can change all these things on the fly while you're printing, including baby stepping. And there are all these settings as well, which now we're getting into details that were controlled from the setup menu. So things you may have a desire to experiment with something. Maybe you want to see how linear advance is going to work for you. So you're in here messing with it. And you can do that in real time and watch the print. So you could just print a large flat object or an X or something and watch how it changes quality as you vary your parameters to tune things in. You'll see this space here between the decimal place and those dots. That's what I'm talking about when I say DGIS 1.4 doesn't do kerning correctly, the spacing of characters on a line. That space is not present on the more modern, updated DGIS operating systems. Finally, miscellaneous settings is what we saw before, getting back to the same screen that was on the setup menu. So you can get to a lot of the setup from um, the printing menu, including editing any of your mesh values. You'll notice they're all zero because I haven't done ABL since I did a reset. And that's how I cancel. Now, it wants me to home XY before it tries to move the head to park it because it can't park it safely not knowing where it's at. That's where that message has come from. So there you have it. That's the quick cook's tour, as they would call it, um, of the user interface. A lot more to get into before you're understanding the answers to certain questions you've probably got by now after using it for a while. But at least it gives you an overview of the philosophy behind the user interface design, where controls are likely to be found when it's something you're specifically you're trying to do. You've noticed that there are a bunch of settings available to you even while you're printing. And the object there was to help you make real-time adjustments as the print is coming out, partly so that when you're printing calibration things, you can put something, let's say, 100% flow um, sample through your slicer and then change the flow rate um, to whatever percentage you want to see how the thing actually turns out as opposed to the way the slicer was originally instructed to make it. These allow you to save printing cycles to print fewer calibration objects and still get the answers to your questions about where should the settings be this time for this filament for this condition and so on. So um, I will now try to make a series of shorter videos. They may not turn out to be any shorter, but details, detailing the individual menus, detailing individual functions, trying to give you a set of workflow. Uh, there's so many ways I could slice and dice this, and I really can't afford to spend the hundreds of hours preparing every permutation and combination. So. I'm um, trying hard to strike a balance between accessible videos, reasonably short. Uh, I do use the table of contents function in the, men, in the YouTube uh, timeline so that you can jump to the one that interests you. And I'm trying to stay under 12 or 15 minutes per video max. And once in a while I digress or I get into something that I find interesting and I find I've made the video far too long. So I'm... Um, 
learning how to edit, um, learning how to keep this simple, make it simple. And this series uh, I will put into a playlist so that you can browse through the list and just pick out the one you're looking for. Thank you for tuning in. I hope I've answered some of your questions and not raised too many new ones. I hope you like the interface and you give it a go. Please just download it and flash it. If you don't like it, it's as simple as flashing again with a different one to be back to where you were. This one works with a 6.1 final community firmware, motherboard firmware. So there were several release candidates up on the repository before on the main one from, from CR6 community repository before I came here to my own repository and posted this one. Only hesitant to brand and color someone else's interface in effect that I have extended without their agreement. So I've put it on my own repository. I can do anything I like there. I've invited the community to give me feedback. If they want to bundle it with the next issue of firmware, they're welcome to do so. It's, it's their software. All I've done is extend it. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.